one of the most remarkable things about string theory is it doesn't merely say that Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum mechanics can fit together. It requires that they both be part of the same theory. So the marriage between the laws of the large, general relativity, and the laws of the small, quantum mechanics, is not only happy, but it's also inevitable, according to this theory. And it's that sense in which string theory unifies everything. Everything arises from vibrational patterns of strings, and the previous conceptions of the forces of nature, gravity being the one I'm focusing upon, but all the other ones as well, are put together inside one coherent, consistent framework. We think that space-time may itself not be fundamental. And what I mean by that is, if you look at this water, you got water, everybody knows what water looks like, we know what it tastes like, it's transparent, we know it's a viscous liquid, but we also know that this liquid water is not fundamental. It's made up of H2O molecules. They are more fundamental than this macroscopic thing that we call liquid water. Now, if I had a little H2O molecule sitting on the top of the podium right here, it would bear no obvious relationship to this glass of water. An H2O molecule don't look like that. But yet, if you have enough H2O molecules and they combine in the right way, it does yield liquid water. We think that space-time may be the same. Space-time has certain features that we are familiar with and that we've uncovered through physics. Nevertheless, we think that space-time itself may be made up of, quote, atoms of space-time, the analog of H2O molecules for water. And if we could find out what those atoms of space-time are, I suspect they will bear very little resemblance to space-time as we experience it, even with the insights that we've gotten from physics so far, but enough of those atoms of space-time come together and it yields the familiar notion of space and time that we experience. If we can delineate what the constituents of space-time are, maybe it's strings, that's a suggestion, I don't know. When we have the candidate and we can establish that that candidate is the constituent of space-time, that, I think, will be the next real revolution in physics. It turns out that string theory requires that our universe have more than the three spatial dimensions that we see in the world around us. So, first off, what does that mean? Well, here we have three dimensions. Say, left-right is one dimension, back-forth is a second dimension, and up-down is a third dimension. And those are the dimensions that we are able to move through freely all the time. We don't even really take note of them. String theory says that there are at least six and probably seven more spatial dimensions that as yet nobody has directly seen. Now that's sort of a wild idea, but after you think about it for a moment, you may say, well, that's cool, but isn't that adequate reason to throw the theory away because there it's making a prediction that it appears manifestly not to be true, so why are people wasting their time on the theory after that realization? And what I hope to do in just the last couple of minutes here is convince you that it's at least possible that our universe actually does have more spatial dimensions than we're directly aware of. And I find it useful to try to get that idea across to forget about the whole universe for a moment and just think about an object in the universe. So this is just a piece of wire, or think of it as a piece of wire. It's actually the, um, it, it holds my sunglasses on. But so, so we have this wire, and you see from far away, imagine you're looking at this from say a quarter mile away. This is going to look like a one-dimensional line, because you're not going to be able to see the thickness from a distant vantage point. So much so that, for instance, if a little ant we're living out its life on the surface of this wire, you'd say to yourself, well, it can move in the left-right dimension, but that's it. There's no other dimension in which it can move. But then, for instance, if you take a pair of binoculars and you zoom in on this wire, or you just get very close to it, you see that indeed there is a second dimension along the surface of the wire. It's this curled up circular girth of the wire. It's a direction that wraps around the wire itself so that your little ant you now recognize can only move in the left-right dimension along the wire. It can also move in the clockwise, counterclockwise direction around the wire. So what this little example alerts us to is the fact that dimensions really come in two varieties. 
They can be big, large, obvious, and really easy to see, like the horizontal extent of the wire. But there can be other dimensions that are tiny and curled up and much more difficult to see, like the circular girth of the wire. Now, granted, it's not that hard to see the circular dimension wrapping around the wire, but you know, you can imagine, say, replacing the wire by something smaller. For instance, if you take a, a piece of thread, right? Now, the thread is much thinner than the wire, and you see that it's much more difficult to actually see the curled up circular part that wraps around the thickness of the thread because it's so thin. Now, imagine taking that idea and pushing it to its limit. You can imagine that you'd be totally fooled when looking at some object in terms of the number of dimensions that it actually has. Now, let's take that idea and apply it to the whole universe, not just an object in the universe, but to the whole universe. Imagine that the fabric of space has three big dimensions, left, right, back, forth, and up, down, the dimensions that we previously mentioned. But imagine that it also has tiny dimensions, like the curled up circular girth of the wire that are tightly crumpled within the fabric of space itself, so tiny that as yet we don't even have the equipment necessary to magnify those dimensions to a big enough size that we can actually see them. That's the idea. That's the way string theory tries to make sense of this strange prediction. Let's take a look at what that would mean visually. So again, as we did before, we'll look at a piece of the fabric of space. And again, by direct observation, it has three large dimensions, which I can only show two here. And our goal now is to probe deep within the fabric of space itself and see how it might have extra hidden dimensions that as yet we're not aware of. Now, we can do this. We probe deep within the spatial fabric. And in fact, here we see two tiny dimensions come into focus, two wrapped up in the shape of a ball. Now, imagine that our little microscopic ant is walking around down here. You see, it can walk around the familiar big dimensions that we were directly aware of before, but it can also walk around these tiny curled up dimensions, curled up directions that we're simply unaware of because they're so tiny, so tightly curled up within the spatial fabric. You see, look, if we again recede back to the familiar ordinary vantage point of day-to-day -day life, the extra dimensions are too small to be seen, and we'd be fooled into thinking that these obvious dimensions are the only dimensions that actually make up the universe. But according to string theory and according to the little picture that we just saw, it's certainly at least possible that the universe does have extra dimensions that are tightly curled within the nooks and crannies of the spatial fabric. In short, the question is, you know, why are our minds such that we remember the past and not the future? In short, I think that basically summarizes it. Why do we have epistemic access, knowledge access to the past, but we don't have the same kind of knowledge access to the future? It is a tough question because, as I describe in the book and as I briefly described here, according to these relativistic ideas in the manner that I describe, there is no special distinction between future and past. It kind of is all there. So why do our minds seem to place more emphasis, far more emphasis, on the past as opposed to the future? I think the answer, and this is not something that we really have the full answer to necessarily, but I think the answer is essentially the same one that I gave when trying to describe why the egg splatters and it doesn't unsplatter, why glasses shatter and don't unshatter. The idea is basically this. We don't really know how the mind works. But if the mind works like a computer, let's just take that as a working model, you know, just so that we have something that we can really think about. Computers have been studied in terms of the way that they acquire memories you know, the memory that a computer has. And that is a process which can be shown to be entropically increasing. That is, we have a certain amount of order before the computer has the memory that we give it, and then the amount of disorder increases. The computer's order might increase, but if you take the whole environment into account, the heat that the computer gives off and so on, the total amount of disorder indeed does increase. So for the same reason that there is this relentless drive from order to disorder, this thing in our head, if it acts like a computer, may also be going along that same direction of time. So this thing may remember the past by virtue of the distinction between order and disorder that comes into play with familiar things like you know, the egg and the glass. I think that's the best answer that we can give so far.
but I agree that it definitely is puzzling. But what I want to stress here are two points. Number one is string theory requires these extra dimensions. It's not something that we pull out of a hat in order to make the theory mysterious or to solve some other puzzle. The theory really requires them. And here's a way that we can make sense of it. And it's a picture of the spatial fabric of our universe that's very unfamiliar, but one that we believe actually to be true. The second feature, which is the feature I'll close with, is this. There are some strange coincidences that have led to the universe as we know it. You see, experimenters have gone out and they've measured a whole list of numbers, a whole list of properties of our universe, such as the mass of the electron, the mass of the quarks, the strength of the gravitational force, the strength of the strong nuclear force, the strength of the weak nuclear force, the strength of the electromagnetic force, the mass of the W vector bosons, the Z bosons, the gluons, all sorts of numbers that have been measured. But nobody knows why the numbers that have been measured are the actual ones that characterize our universe. Now you might say, well, so what? You know, they measure these numbers, that's how the universe is put together, and we just should accept it. But the reason why that answer is not particularly satisfying is this. If you change any of those numbers by even a small amount, the mass of the electron or the strength of gravity, by even a few percent, the universe as we know it goes away. You see, stars, for instance, rely upon nuclear processes, which would not occur if there wasn't a very delicate and intricate relationship and balance between the numbers that have been measured, the properties of the fundamental ingredients making up the universe. If you change those numbers by even a small amount, nuclear processes don't happen, stars don't light up, and without stars, the universe is a very different place. It's hard to imagine, for instance, how life would even form in a universe without stars. So a key question, and perhaps I think the deepest question of science is, why is it that our universe is constructed in just the right way so that there can be stars and planets and life as we know it? Why is it that way? Now, there is no theory prior to string theory which even attempts to address that question. But for the first time in the history of science, string theory at least sets up a framework for answering that question. It has not answered it yet. But the framework that string theory sets up is basically the following. You see, when a little string vibrates, its vibrational patterns determine all of those properties of the universe as we know it. The electron has the mass that it does because its little string is vibrating in a particular way. Einstein taught us that E equals mc squared, energy and mass, are two sides of the same coin. A more energetically vibrating string means more mass. A less energetically vibrating string means less mass. The precise mass of an electron is determined by the energy of that little vibrating string. That's why it has its mass, and similarly for the mass of every other particle, as well as the strength of the forces of nature. Now, a little string is so tiny that it doesn't just vibrate when it vibrates into the familiar dimensions, it also vibrates into those tiny curled up dimensions. See, they're really tiny, but so is a string. It can actually vibrate and probe within those extra dimensions. And calculations have shown that the precise way in which those extra dimensions are curled up, I showed you an example where they were curled up into a little ball, but there are many other exotic possibilities. Some pictures are actually in the book. The precise way in which those extra dimensions are curled up affects the vibrational patterns of the strings. And it's those vibrational patterns which should account for everything about the universe that we have measured and which makes it have the properties that we're familiar with. So the goal of string theory at the moment is to precisely understand how the extra dimensions are curled up, exactly what they look like. We've gotten close to that answer, but it has not been nailed down yet. And once we have that, to calculate precisely how those extra dimensions affect the vibrational patterns of strings, and in that way hopefully answer that deep, deep question of why it is that the fundamental numbers characterizing our universe are just such to allow the universe as we know it to exist. That's the goal that people are going to be pursuing well into the next century, and string theory is the guiding framework for trying to do that. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Since my book has come out, actually, 
I've gotten a lot of response, both through email and ordinary mail, and some of it's been a little bit on the wild side, some of it's been flattering, which is very gratifying. But there's one that I thought I would share with you, because I think it's the most interesting of, of the responses that I've gotten. Dear Professor Green, I'm a high school student and wanted to thank you for writing The Elegant Universe. It has answered many questions about the universe which have puzzled me for a long time. I did want to tell you, though, about an experience I had while reading your book. One day during algebra class, which I hate, I was reading your book in the back of the room and I just got to the part about the fabric of space tearing and all of a sudden my nose started to bleed. And I never get nosebleeds. Well, that night I went back to reading and wouldn't you know it, my nose starts to bleed again. I struggled to finish the chapter, turning pages with one hand and keeping pressure on my nose with the other. <laughs> Slowly the bleeding stopped and I was able to finish the last few chapters without further incident. So when people say this stuff is mind-blowing, maybe there's some literal truth there. <laughs> String theory is just that, a theory. For us to really take in these cutting-edge ideas more fully, we have to prove it. We have to find experimental vindication of the theory. Now, one approach is to build atom smashers, accelerators. This is being done. There's a big accelerator being built in Geneva, Switzerland, at CERN, called the Large Hadron Collider. It should be ready by 2007 or 2008. And through high energy collisions between particles that go around a tunnel in opposite directions and every so often are brought together in these high energy head-on collisions in the debris from those collisions we hope that we may be able to see subtle remnants or maybe not so subtle remnants of the physics of string theory that's one approach may work i hope it works another approach is one that i'm working on a number of people around the world are working on and it approaches the problem in a completely different way. So let me just finish with this idea. I'll start with an analogy. Imagine I had a little balloon, and I have a really fine pen, and I write a tiny little message on the balloon, so tiny that you can't see it. If I now blow air into the balloon and cause the surface of the balloon to expand, the message that I wrote will get stretched out. It'll become much more easy for you to see. Take that idea and perhaps imagine it applying to the universe in the following way. Just after the Big Bang, the universe was very small. Strings are also very small, and through their vibrations, these strings could have left imprints on the environment of the young universe. Now, the imprints were so small, and the universe was so small that nobody could see it, and there's nobody around to see it anyway. But then, through 14 billion years of cosmic expansion, space stretched. And just as the stretching of the surface of the balloon makes my little scribbled message stretch out, making it much more easy to see, as space stretches, the little imprints of string theory may well be stretched across the sky. So it may be that the data showing that string theory is true is already out there. All we need to do is receive the light from the technical term is the microwave background radiation, tiny temperature variations in that microwave background radiation may in fact be the signature of string theory written clear across the sky. All we have to do is learn how to read the message and if this program is successful, I absolutely consider it a long shot, but if it is successful there, well to my mind there would be nothing more poetic. There would be no outcome more graceful, no unification that would be